So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my friend from LA, Paul Epstein. Thank you. Thank you. Well, for one, I am not uh, four feet, 33 inches tall. I will never get confused for Mr. Kurt David over there. But you know who I have been confused for? So I'll, I'll start with a disclaimer. I would say over under about 38 of you have confused me for Davin Salvagno in the last couple of days. So I just want to throw that out there. No, we do share a heart. We do share purpose point and we share just every ounce of our energy being poured into this summit. But Davin's back there, I am up here. So just want to kick off with that. All right, Kurt mentioned the sports background. So let's say, because in an hour, we're out of here. And in my opinion, that's when the work begins. That is when it begins. This right here, this conversation we're about to have is the fourth quarter of the game, and we are in the closing minutes. But as you know, it is what happens in the unseen hours that defines how we show up in these critical moments. Not just here today, not just at the summit, but most importantly, what we do effective when we leave. So I wanna rally us around this thought of, yes, there is a big picture of inspiration. We're gonna fire out of a cannon. Frankly, most events, summits, conferences, even the ones not about purpose, you'll be feeling like you could take over the world, right? And if you were to be honest, because I've been honest with myself, I look back at countless events, not the ones I've spoken at, but the ones that I just purely attended. And I'm not proud to say this, but most of them turned out to be nothing more than a sugar high. And that, to me, is the biggest letdown that I could have for myself. So I want to inspire us around a message that yes, we are gonna go out and do amazing things, but it starts by winning on Monday. That is the mindset. When we think of purpose, I don't look at it as a distant North Star. I look at it as a 365 way of life, a 365 way of showing up. One decision, one action at a time. So today, as we see up here, we'll talk about leading with our head, heart, and hands. I believe that if we can have greater ownership of our mindset, greater authenticity in our heart, then it can drive more purposeful action. That is how the head, heart, and hands are all connected. And let me just uh, show this as well. So here we are, we're in Notre Dame. Can I get a show of hands of either A, you came to Notre Dame, or B, you're a Notre Dame fan? All right, cool. So I'm gonna say fight on Trojans, and I'm gonna say go blue Wolverines. <laughs> and y'all still love me because we're here around purpose, right? That's the only thing that could bring the fighting Irish Trojan and Wolverines together. But yes, undergrad, I was out there in LA doing my thing decades ago, not to date me, and then more recently, exec MBA from the University of Michigan. But I share this because that is the power of purpose. I'm giving bear hugs, I am so stoked to be here with so, it's, it's not just the folks that came here, even though that's what I asked, it's that special feeling of walking around this campus. Every step I've taken here has felt special. There is an intentionality. Purpose to me just is this spirit that's infused throughout these walls. And so I know this is a special place. And yes, I may root against this place one time a year, but regardless, that is small game. The big game is not only how we can live and lead through our head, heart, and hands to have a more purposeful life, but more importantly, equally importantly, I'll say, how do we now share the space with the people that aren't in this room? I spoke a couple weeks ago at a conference in Vegas and the theme of the conference, which is super fitting for the last couple of years that we've been through, it was getting the band back together. That was the theme of the conference. And I shared with that group and I feel compelled to share this with you. Yes, we are a band and we in the last three days have gotten this band back together. But as soon as you get out of here, you're about to go say hello to some amazing bands as well. When you walk in your home, when you step back into the office, on your next Zoom meeting, those bands count just as much as this one, just as much. So let's go forward with that energy. Now, Kurt mentioned here, 
about some of the places. The, I call these the brands, the business cards, the logos that I've represented. So you could see there, it was from an entry level to an executive level. Most recently, head of sales and biz dev for the San Francisco 49ers. After being in the NFL League office, getting to be a part of the first Super Bowl in New York, setting some revenue records. So sales and biz dev was always my lane. And you could say that I've had a lot of exposure to high performance, high achievement. You could ask me what separates the elite from the pack because the way the business world worked where I came from, it was purely goals, metrics, KPIs. That's it. So I started to think about, is there a more purposeful way of driving performance? And that was the origin story. If I was to ask myself, what leads to NFL, NBA, professional sports teams winning on the field, it's how they align their head, their heart, and their hand off of the field. And I want to throw three table stakes out there that, in my opinion, before we can talk about whether it's bigger purpose or the 365 purpose, I think there are three table stakes. This is the ante to play. One, with your head, do you feel a sense of presence? Is there an elevated mindset that you have to be where your feet are? As my good friend Scott O'Neill says, be where your feet are. By the way, phenomenal book. Please pick it up. He's just a saint in the space of purpose and sports and every other space in between. But the head is about that awareness, the core of EQ, the core that drives us. Now, we think about our heart. I look at that as the litmus test of authenticity. Are you living life on your terms or somebody else's terms? And only you can answer that. So that's my courageous challenge to this group because we cannot possibly ignite our head and our heart if we don't tap in to ownership, not just of the good, more importantly, of the bad. No victims, external circumstances are realities, but we still got to own it. And then with our hands, it's action. April said earlier, and I love that she brought us here, she said, I'm going to introduce you to a decision-making framework. And I think where April and I align on so many levels, I really simplify life like this. And I think that this can simplify. No one can create an easy life, but I think we can simplify life. That's been another through line of the summit today. The quality of business and the quality of life is determined by two things. The decisions we make and the actions we take. I'll repeat that. The quality of business and the quality of life comes down to two things. The decisions we make and the actions we take. When you can really make life a decision in action game, it's a lot easier to process. And it's that simple equation, the head, heart, hands equation is what I will introduce by the end of our time together. And mark my words, and this is a bold statement, but I hope that you feel it is a true statement by the time that I get off this stage. I believe that if the end game is a life of purpose, on purpose, every single day, I believe that the head, heart, hands equation is the only equation that you will need to get there. And we're gonna know it in the next 45 minutes. So with that, this is all a respectful challenge. This is all very inspiring as we're about to launch out of the summit. But let me introduce you to a couple friends. And actually, I've seen some of this, whether through April or Sam's story, which was so heartwarming. And thank you so much for your message as well. But this is what we're going back to, folks. If you take a look at these two characters over here, this is a metaphor for how a lot of us personally, professionally have been feeling or the person down the hall. The last two years have been the most disruptive we've ever had. And I don't need to beat that dead horse. We've all talked about that infinitely over the past couple of days. But this is what we're going back to. So here is my word of caution. And I subscribe to this theory because I will tell you an event like this changed my life. So for those of, of us and not in this room, but of others that say a speech can change your life. BS. Yes, it can. It changed my life. Oh, but a retreat. Oh, it's just a little woo woo and feel good stuff. BS. It changed my life. And I'm, I'm going to tell you that story during our time together today. But what I realized is the more that I came back with my head in the clouds and if people were feeling like this on the inside, then it was tone deaf. And that's really where I want to simplify this. Yes to purpose. But when we can simplify to the head, heart, and hand level, even people that are in a rough spot can say, okay, I'm here, I'm listening, I'm receiving your message, and now we co-create whatever that turns out to be. 
So here's also another reality, as you see here through this image. Welcome to leadership. Welcome to leadership. This is your Monday. It's waiting. Your inbox is full. I saw everyone at that late night reception. I know your inboxes were piling up. Mine too. I get it. I get it. But this is us. This is it. So if this is the case, again, we come back to this theme of simplicity because that ain't simple. Those are just the demands, the responsibilities. Many of us have heard the morning practice, which I am a massive fan of, that the moment that you look at your phone, you are living on other people's terms. The moment you look at your phone and you start scrolling or you look at your inbox or Instagram or LinkedIn or whatever it is, and I'm not saying it's all bad, but for a lot of us, it manages us versus are we managing it? And part of the way we manage it is we start with intentionality in every single day. So a best practice, a good practice would be, how are you focusing on you so that your cup is full and now we can pour ourselves more into others, but it starts with the only part of the day that you can fully control, which is usually before other people wake up. So that's what brings me back to this theme that we're looking at here. Of course, I want you to live a more purposeful life. I do. Of course, I believe that we are all here for a bigger reason. I do. But I know that when we talk to the bands that are not in this room, this message of winning on Monday is a much better way to connect. And you all know this, progress and momentum can be our best friends. When you win on Monday, you're more likely to win on Tuesday, and it starts to become infectious. And then you win on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And now you got a winning streak in sports terms, but in life terms, it works just the same. So my through line here is, what win on Monday will you commit to? And I believe that the head, heart, hands equation can be part of what gets you there. So this to me is just a simple kind of round the, the horn, if you will, of what we're going to do today. We'll start with leadership because my belief is that we set the tone for culture. Culture then sets the tone for our people. People drive the performance of our business and then all equally fuel the health of our team. So if I was to ask you, here are some historical figures, but I'm not going to take it there. I want you to get personal here. Leadership gets personal. Who is the best leader, the greatest leader that you've ever had? Greatest leader. It could be a parent. It could be a coach. It could be a mentor. Maybe it is somebody in business. And the list goes on. Think of that person right now. And if I was to ask you, what did they do? Actions and behaviors. What did they do? So I'm just going to popcorn out some responses here. Imagine I'm at a flip chart and I'm, we're here at a workshop and I'm just jotting down one or two word responses. Super, super small, simple stuff. What did they do? Just hit me from this side. We'll start. They listen. They listen. Thank you. Bear hugs. They care. They, care. they, challenge. they challenge. Yes. Empower. They empower. Okay, to the middle. Illuminated, you're using a lot of syllables. Illuminated blind spots, that is true, yes. Love? Love. Heart, yes. What else? We're going to this side. Extended trust. <laughs> Extended trust. Time, time is the currency of leadership. Time is the currency of leadership, yes. What else? Belief, and what was the second? Motivate. Motivate. Expectation, did I hear that right? They said expectation, love it. Okay, last but not least, over here, what do we got? Discipline. Discipline. Couple more. Educate. 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 Influence. Influence, boom. So now, think of all those things that we just said. If I pull out a Webster uh, dictionary, I look up leadership and it's gonna be something around rank, role, title, authority, okay. Well, if that's the case, then 10% of the world is a leader and 90% are not. Do you believe in that world? Of course you don't. That's why we're here. I would also challenge us to ask ourselves, hmm, all those things you said from listening and caring and challenging and empowering and having trust, for which of those do you need a rank, role, title, or authority? For which of those? And so here is my message. We've all heard the saying that before you lead others, you must first lead yourself. 
before you lead others, you must first lead yourself because when you lead yourself, A, you own life, and B, no title is required. Leadership itself requires zero title, zero. And all those things you just said, and by the way, here are some results. I'll pull it up in a second. This is from other workshops that I've done, so we'll get this up. Take a look at this. Take a look. There's going to be a lot of words here that you just said. And if we could pull this up, please. Those are from other groups. And take a listen. Take a look, I should say. Take a picture. Memorialize this. By the way, everything I'm going to share with you today, I hope that it's very tactical because it's the last close of the summit. I hope that these are things you can take back to the other bands that are outside of this room. With your team, you could ask them what do great leaders do. And here's the challenge. If it's nothing more than an activity, that's cool. It's going to help a little bit. And then it'll probably wash away. Or, or does this become the job description? This can be the greatest job description that we've ever had. And as leaders, when we start to evaluate people and evaluate ourselves, by the way, goals and metrics and KPIs can be 50% of what matter. I used to think it was 100% because that's how I was brought up. And I'm not blaming them. That's just who I was. And then when I started to make this 50% of the job description, that's when the game changed. I would still be in sports if this was 100%, or excuse me, 0% of the job description. I would still be there. I would still. But now, where we start to pour ourselves in others, this becomes the job description. So with that, let's shift gears a bit in terms of leadership going into culture. And culture, to me, it can look a lot like this illustration here. Raise your hand if you believe that culture is top down. Okay, not a lot of hands. Good. I think there is influence from the top because I think to have a best in class culture, we need our executives, we need C-suite to cascade the right type of culture that we all in this room subscribe to. But what if it was a yes and? Yes, and. Yes, top of an org chart can influence it, set the tone for it perhaps, but what if all culture could be local? All culture is local is a much more inclusive, we talk about inclusivity a lot. Well, if people don't feel, if, if we're just saying here's the playbook, go execute, versus what kind of plays do you want to run, that's a very different message that we're sending. So if all culture is local, here's my example. So I used to do consulting with a top three airline. They've got about 120-ish thousand employees, 6,000 positional leaders, positional. So my company and I, we did workshops with all 6,000 time after time again. And people in my network would always ask me, so Paul, what's the culture of the airline? And instead of just spitting out a response, I would say, I don't know, I need a little more info. I would ask you, who's the leader? What location, what department, what floor of the building? That's the culture. Because when I would go in floor five, they're high-fiving and then floor six, shh, watch out, boss is around the corner. Folks, this was not only the same company, it was the same department. Floor five and floor six, drastically different weather systems, which proves the point that all culture can be local. So I want to challenge everybody to think about culture as a climate and a weather system. And when you can own your weather system and own your climate, each of us, every time we walk in a room, myself included, for sure, you walk in a room and one of two things happens. You either warm it up or you cool it off. The question is, are we aware of our own temperature? Every time you walk in a room, are you aware of your own temperature? Takes a lot of discipline, takes it top of mind, but once we can do this, imagine the power of us owning our weather system, us owning our local culture, and then every single person to our left and right does the same. That's how culture scales. Top down doesn't scale, local culture does. I learned this lesson from these two guys. When I was at the Niners, GM John Lynch 
head coach Kyle Shanahan. So the way sports works, to give you a peek behind the curtain, in most organizations, there's a church and state type of relationship. Football's over here, business over there, there's a wall in between, and you don't cross the wall. But these guys come in, tore down the wall, and said, we will rebuild our culture brick by brick. Each person represented a brick. Each one of us was given a seat at the table of culture because it's as local as one person. So here's how that showed up. We brought in Simon Sinek to help find our organizational why. Should be a familiar name. And then these ended up being our hows. So we got the big why and then we developed some hows. And then of course under this were values and behaviors and actions. So it got very granular, but these were the five hows. And I'm gonna spend some time on this fifth one because I think this, if we can conquer this piece, there could be some tremendous impact that follows the summit. So we were identified, folks, as a low trust organization. Kind of sucks to hear that. You are a low trust organization. All right, so what do you want me to do about it? So a consultant comes in, different company, and he says, I'm gonna do listening sessions, which I heard from the folks at Lippert and I've heard from other folks, whether speaking or in the audience, listening. By the way, fun fact, what great leaders do, those lists, you might have noticed listening is circled. It's because I would ballpark 90 to 95% of the time, it is in the top five responses. So I just say, you can say anything. What do great leaders do? 90% of the time, top five answer, listen. Why? Because it's so sought after, we love it so much, and it's so rarely practiced. Hmm. That's the power of listening. So these listening sessions do three things, three questions. What do we need to do more of? What do we need to do better? What do we need to do different? And if you're willing <laughs> to hear the better and different, a lot of change can happen. So here's how this goes. And this is my favorite place in sports, the 49ers Players Cafeteria. It is amazing, amazing how you could manage a 6,000 calorie diet and still have six pack abs. <laughs> I'm still working on that one. Not the first one, hopefully. This is a cafeteria, so this is how it works. So you scan your badge and five bucks comes out of your next paycheck and it's awesome. Like there's players, there's coaches, there's business folks and you sit down and you congregate, you do your thing and you break bread. And that was the intention. But let's just say that you're sprinting from meeting to meeting to meeting. There was a to-go box and you get your five minutes, you throw some food in the box and off you go to the next meeting. Cool, understood. We were an organization of about 250 people. And then there were those five bad apples that would do this. They would sit down, they'd eat, they'd do their thing. And then when they were done eating, they'd go grab a box and take home that night's dinner. Ugh. So there's a security camera over the scan badge area. What do you think the head of security did? Take away the boxes. And so when our consultant asked, okay, so you keep bringing up trust whether boss or company or just trust, 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 trust. He said, give me an example, give me an example, give me an example. And this lunchbox story was the one that came up the most. And so here it is, I'll give you the quick backstory. So imagine, all right, 250 people, five bad apples, lunchboxes go away. And instead of penalizing the five, apply this to your companies, we've all been there, okay? Instead of penalizing the five, the other 245 lose. The ones that weren't doing anything wrong. So these five, all right, it happens, and they take it away. And then in these listening sessions with a lot of venom, I'm gonna give you the rated PG version. Uh, I'm gonna clean it up, okay? This is the purpose summit, so I feel a little bit, a little bit better. All right, these folks would say, you know how pissed I am that I pour my soul into this place, like my blood, my sweat, my tears. I got a 10 a.m., an 11 a.m., a 12 p.m., a 1 p.m., a 2 p.m., all in service of the company. And I used to just go in for those five minutes and fuel up and get my lunchbox, and now they're not there. And you know how many days I'm running on empty now? And again, you can add a lot of expletives and exclamation marks to that, but that's what they told the consultant. So then the consultant goes to the team president and says, hey, you know about the to-go boxes? He's like, what the hell are you talking about? You got no idea, okay. So three weeks later, we're at an all hands meeting and the team president of the 49ers walks up to the podium and says, ladies and gentlemen, to-go boxes are coming back. And an hour or two later, same all hands, me and him were just grabbing a drink on the side and he leans over to me and he's like, dude, I don't know if I've ever heard a louder standing ovation than that. <laughs> this is an NFL team president and it was a to-go box. But it happened and it's real and it'd be in the room. 
It was magical because I, I hope we're connecting the dots. It was so much bigger than a box, so much bigger. We listened to people. They spoke truth to power. And they influenced the environment where we asked them to dedicate themselves to. It was so much bigger than a box. And here is my message for you. There is a to-go box inside of your team and organization that you don't know about. I promise you. I promise you. So, without just cracking a whip here, this is, hey, I'm, I'm as guilty as the next person. So here would be the, the call to action, and I'm going to provide a small piece that I think can help if you're inspired to host a listening session of your own. So here it is. I'll leave this up for about 30 seconds. This is my email. This is straight out of my book, Power of Playing Offense. There's a very, it's granular, so it's like seven pages. It's a step-by-step -step instruction manual of what you need, how you facilitate a listening session. It is literally from how you set up the room to how you invite folks. There's a script on, hey, if you feel you're a high trust versus low trust organization, here's how I would tailor the language. Once you're in there, here's how you ask the questions. Here's how many people in a session. It is very detailed intentionally because I feel those details matter. So now you have my details. So just tell me to send you the lunchbox. I'll know what you mean. Okay, just be funny with the subject line, I'll hit you back, and we will be good. So that is a bit on listening. I believe that this can be a transformer for everybody in the room. All right, so we shift gears. Let's go to purpose. If you were to ask me most purpose-filled memories, moments, events, experiences, as a football guy at heart, I would have looked at those two trophies and said, man, if I could be a part, especially in a leadership role, are you kidding me? Like, no doubt those would have been the most purposeful ones, but, I can now reflect back and say that they finish a very distant second. Because in March of 2016, I got to marry my best friend, my rock, and my soulmate on the field of Levi Stadium. Now, a couple of things I'm going to call out. For one, it was absolutely her idea, I swear. Do you really want to get married where you work? Just ask yourself. It's a cool place, but it's where I work. All right. Two is you look at her top right, you look at me, you're like, dude, you totally outkicked your coverage. <laughs> fact. 100% fact. But remember, I've got a sales background, so you could call this the greatest sale of my life. Now, as of about a year and change ago, we are proud parents of baby PJ. At the time, we did not have any babies, but we had a couple fur babies up there on the video board. They made their virtual cameo appearance. And the last thing I'll call out is, you can't tell by the last name of Epstein, but mom, proud Mexican descent, married into a full Mexican family. So let's just say there were a lot of tacos, a lot of tequila, and a mariachi band of first in Levi Stadium history. Yeah, there we go. Now, I share this from a a stoked but a very humble place to say that life was really good. Nothing was broken. I wasn't trying to fix a thing. So then why, a little over a year after this magical day on the field, why did I have a Jerry Maguire moment? I left sports 100% on my own terms. No regrets. Never looked back, never felt more alive because it was based on one thing and one thing only. I found my why. That retreat that I told you changed my life? Yes. 25 leaders at the Niners went off two days, found our why, tapped into our values, which I had no idea what they were prior to this retreat, and now I started to think about this is pretty awesome. How do I apply this on a day-to-day -day basis? Was everybody thinking that? Of course not. But the reason my life changed is because I got obsessed with this thing about why and values and what? Like it can actually drive how you show up. And so here's kind of how it unfolded. So I go back into the office and I'm just radiating and glowing this different type of energy, probably more energy than I have on this stage. It's very hard to do. And I go back and people are just flabbergasted, like, dude, what was in the punch? What, what happened at the retreat? And I just shared the experience. And then I thought that was the end of the story, but then the following day, one person, just one, came up to me and said, hey, that thing you did at the retreat, you think you could do the same for me? And the next day, one more person 
One led to two, led to five, led to 10, led to nearly 50 people over the course of six, seven months. It started a business, it went to players, it started to be water cooler buzz. Even HR called me in and said, hey, it's gonna be opt-in, we're not gonna push this. Opt-in, would you mind coaching people to find their why during the onboarding process? That's how it went. And that's how I became known as the why coach of the 49ers. Now, Ask me to define what a Y coach does. And this applies to people, teams, organizations. It goes from the micro to the macro, that's for sure. But the simplistic way of thinking about it, for me at least, was I help people find their compass. I've also heard it called a GPS system. I've also heard it called an operating system. It's all good. Let's call it a compass for now. Now, let me show you what a compass looks like when you're a Y coach. So at the heart of it, you got a Y. And then you're thinking about, now, how do I get a little bit closer to being more tangible? And my belief is that's the values. Together, from the inside out, those two represent who you are. Now, some attitudes start to form, and we call it a belief system. And that's what you stand for. And then the last layer, speaking of making the call, April, the decisions and the actions. Remember, I said quality of business, quality of life relies on two things the decisions you make and the actions you take. So these outer layers are how you show up. Now the question for everybody is, are they all aligned and connected? Is who you are, what you stand for, and how you show up all one? Or does it depend on the day, or how we're feeling, or the market, or external circumstances? Because if we want consistency and authenticity, clarity, conviction. This is the model. And I didn't do this intentionally because this is what I was literally coaching years ago. I didn't know that the head, the heart, and the hands would end up being a thing I talked about. And I, now that I reflect back, I'm like, oh my God, they're all there. Your heart, your why, your values, right? You're thinking about your belief system is your head. Your hands is how you show up, your actions. Totally accidental, but I think this is all meant for us to be here socializing around this campfire of a very simple model. And each of us has this compass, as do teams, as do organizations. So here's the really cool thing. I used to think about, all right, you can bring in a one-to-one -one coach to find your why. You can do some workshops. Or now, this is literally very hot off the press. Uh, Kurt mentioned senior advisor to the Y Institute. There's a five minute solution that now for individuals, you can find your why. And the way that this works, because it almost sounds like a fast pass, frankly, I was not a believer when I was first pitched the concept. I was like, no, dude, this is way too quick, way too fast. Like, no, nope, you, you gotta go hours or half a day or a full day. And the thing is, I've probably had over a thousand folks that have run through this to date and then hundreds of conversations from that. And I'm just very direct, like, do you agree with what the result was, and literally only a single person said, I'm not sure. The other said, 100%. And so here's the nine whys. We're not gonna dive deep today, but I'll, I'll share a little something that will keep the impact going forward post summit, but these are the nine whys. I promise you, your why is on this screen right now. Maybe you're a contribute person, and impact is what gets you out of bed. Maybe you're a simplified person. Maybe you're a better way, a right way. Mastery, you like to go deep on the one thing but you feel that there are some gifts hidden in the treasure that's there. So this is what we're gonna do with this conversation. And this is less about, hey, do it in the moment. I don't even know, frankly, if the, the QR code works way up there. Here's what we're gonna do. If it works, awesome. Uh, when you get settled back at home or whenever you have some downtime post-summit, please take it. It's a gift on purpose. We already took care of the economics, so it's yours, it's a gift. But uh, the other thing is we'll send it in an email if you want access for you and your team and what I really want to do, because I, I believe it is a game changer to find your why, but now let's expand the pool. Let's expand the pool. And so when we do email communication, which will say, hey, let's do a virtual experience, 60 minutes, let's call it 30 days from now, and we jump into this, I want to create a conversation that answers one question. How well do you know your locker room? I'll repeat that. How well do you know your locker room? Because when you can communicate why to why, there are some special things that can happen from that. And so we all know about the golden rule. 
This is how I look at an elevated version of a golden rule. Treat others as you want to be treated. We've all heard that. But the platinum rule, maybe not everybody has heard of it. A lot of us have. Treat others as they want to be treated because until we're speaking their love language, until we're speaking their why, they're not going to feel maximum empathy or trust or connection because you're literally, you're like, well, this is my why and this is how we're going to express my why. Mm, it's okay. Versus in my locker room, I understand there's 20 people with 20 unique whys and I start to coach and lead and show up in service of their why. That's how this all comes together. So now we go into this debate of why versus purpose. And I will admit, I used to use them interchangeably. Even during the why coach period, folks, I, I did not have any hard, strong opinion or definition of what's why versus purpose, zero. Now, I'm not saying it's right, I'm saying it's an opinion, but at least I have clarity on how I view it. The why is about, I believe that we have one why. I believe we have a why. And I do believe that that can live out there, it can be macro, there can be a who baked into it, which I'll get to mine in a second. But I believe we could have that why. But with purpose, it's really different. Purpose can be applied to many areas of life as long as they are meaningful to you. That's the catch. You got to have meaning. You got to care in order to live with purpose in area. I believe you can have purpose at work. I believe you could have purpose at home. Of course you can. I believe there's purpose in the community. Yes, there can be. If there's a cause that speaks to you, that's an expression of purpose. Purpose is plural. Why is singular. And if we can understand that why, then we can anchor ourselves to it, we can tether ourselves to it, we always make sure we never get too far away from it because that's the beauty of how that relationship works. But purpose is the what, purpose is the expressions of our what. And at least for me, I don't know how you feel, when I used to hear purpose and your central reason for being, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that, look, that, that sounds so big. And then even when I thought I found mine, then I started to explain it to others and if they didn't know their greater purpose, it was kind of deflating. I'm just going to shoot straight. We are at the purpose summit. If you say the word purpose, it is not a positive word to everybody. So how do we reframe it so it can be better received? And when purpose becomes a 365 lifestyle, when I could say, hey, I know you, you, you're a mom, you're a sister, you're a hero in the community. Like, though there's purpose baked into that. And that people feel like they can do, whether we call it purpose or not. I don't care about how we brand it. I care about how people are feeling from the inside out. And I know we would all align on that. So just want to respectfully put it out there that when I was preaching the North Star stuff, I lost some people. I did. So I'm just trying to bring it down to the lowest common denominator. All right. So this whole wrestling in my mind became an obsession, which is now leading into a second book. And this will launch next year. And I'll go quickly through this. But it's less about the book, it's more about the message, which has to do with head, heart, hands. Because of that confusion, that complication of the greater purpose, and so I'm just on the front lines. I'm just, so to use a little in nurse happy, like I'm not in a great place. Like there is trauma, there is healing, and this person, we're talking about purpose? So I really started to think about like, all right, how can we step into this and make this accessible? And so I started from, okay, who are people that I know that have achieved both success and significance, and significance, not just success, and we all, if you ask me to define that, success is serving yourself, significance is serving others. So when we can find people that are kicking butt in both, all right, I'm gonna wanna learn or two, uh, a thing or two from them. So a couple of things, whether colleagues or friends or podcast guests, a couple of areas, and I probably have 30, 40, 50 conversations that we're populating this, socializing this, like what is the common thread? Why are you achieving success and significance? Why do you feel that you step into each day with greater purpose? And by the way, not all of them could say what their bigger purpose was or their bigger why, but they just felt purpose in every day. So that's an interesting call out there. But then I wanted to make this by the people for the people. So you think about the folks that are in service and are out there putting themselves in harm's way so that we can feel more safety in the world that we live in. You think about Hardest leadership I've ever had is at home, as a dad. And so there's leaders at home. And maybe there is 
a community champion that's out there just doing the good deeds because their heart is baked into a cause. And so this is how, as I thought about, okay, sports industry, head, heart, hands, like that makes sense. But does, is this isolated or does this apply? And that's really what got me inspired to try to build a movement around head, heart, and hands. And yes, it's gonna lead into an equation, but first I just wanted to set the table that this is the awareness driver, this is the ownership driver, this is the authenticity driver, this is the action driver that, in my opinion, can make purpose. We can democratize purpose. Everybody can have a seat at the table of purpose when we make it simple enough that they can win on Monday. That's what this is about. So with that, I'd like to share a story about a person that for me, and you, everybody in this room has that person. For me, this is the person that exemplifies head, heart, and hands. So for one, I am the gap tooth kid. And two, it's my dad, it's my hero. And I lost my hero at 19 years old. By trade, my dad was an educator. He taught at continuation schools, which for those that aren't familiar with what a continuation school is, it's a kid's last chance. They've been kicked out of traditional schools, they landed at continuation, and in most cases they've been given up on. Disadvantaged background. Your hope and prayer is they don't go on to become a statistic on the street. And after teaching in traditional schools, he chose continuation. So years after my dad passes, I'm in a barber shop a couple blocks away from the school that he taught at. And I'm in the barber seat, and in walks in this seven-foot tall man, tattoos all visible, including on his face, which you know what that means. Somebody that if you saw in a dark alley, you would run the other way. And here it is, and we lock eyes, and he's coming right at me, and I see his hand go up, and I'm like, oh my gosh, what did I do to deserve this? And I totally expected to see a fist, but instead, when I opened my eyes, I saw a finger. A finger that was pointing right at me. And he came up to me and said, are you Mr. Epstein's son? I said, yeah. He said, I thought it was you. I remember you were on the side of the stage that I graduated from, and... Anyways, I just wanted to come over and say thank you. Thank you because your dad was the first person that ever believed in me. I've had a job for two consecutive months now, and that may not sound like much to you, but to me, it means the world. And this next part was the one that got me. He said, your dad gave me a reason to think that tomorrow is worth it. I didn't know that there are people around us every day that don't feel that tomorrow is worth it. And in an instant, I learned everything that I needed to learn about my dad, leaving people, places better than he found them. I learned the definition, the true definition of leadership. I learned about impact. And if you wanna make a difference, this guy, that moments before was scaring me, now seemed like an angel delivering a message. And so if my dad could create that impact, I always share with people, if I could have one-tenth of the impact that he had, then it'll be a great life. And now over to you. Who is that person for you? Whether still with you, and I hope that they are, or with you in memory, because I know that when we can tap into the power of the most important person in our life, you won't ever want to let them down. You will let yourself down before you let the most important person in your life down. So every single day, I have a fancy way to describe my why. You know what it is. Like, screw the fancy. Make them proud. That's it. That's my measurement of success. That's my measurement of impact. Because I know if I'm doing that, great things are happening. And sometimes we literally need to attach our why to a who in order to make it count. So I hope that this can be an impactful way to pay it forward and dedicate Monday, Tuesday, this year, whatever scale of time you want, 
dedicated to the most important person in your life. And now, this is a really cool part. So now, as of about a year ago, I get to do my best. <laughs> and um, gosh, baby PJ. I just can't wait to tell him about his grandfather. I can't wait to share that story about the barbershop with little PJ. And I know everybody in this room, we all separate from a summit. We all go back to our respective homes and hometowns and communities, places of impact, and it's all possible. So now, home stretch. And Sam, thank you for buying me a couple extra minutes here, my friend. <laughs> so here's where we dive into the home stretch, which is all about the head, the heart, and the hands. Here's a fork in the road. So if life, the quality of life and the quality of business is based on the decisions that we make and the actions that we take, we have a choice. Every single day, we have a choice. Do we go left, do we go right? And these massive decisions, I'm not talking about do you turn left into the driveway or do you uh, brush your teeth today? Like I'm not talking the simple stuff because fun fact, the average adult makes 35,000 decisions in a day. 35,000. They're not all like super important. Most of them are autopilot. And again, I don't want to get into neuroscience because that's not my area of specialty, but 35,000 is a big number. We don't have the mental capacity to process that many. So what about those 10, 15, 20 a day that do have significance where we don't know what to do, where we're not on autopilot? Strategy A or B, team, hire or fire. Invest, project, initiative, yes, no. This is a binary game. This can be a binary game and these decisions and actions can have massive implications. And in the last two years where stress and uncertainty and anxiety are at an all time high, it makes this fork in the road even harder. We're not showing up healthy minded every day and even if we are, are the people that are on our teams and that we serve? Probably not. And so this can be a paralyzing fork in the road. But what if it didn't have to be? What if there was an equation that could tell us to go left or right and we had clarity, we had conviction, we had confidence, there was purpose, there was authenticity all baked in and you can make the decision within seconds. This is the head, heart, hands equation. You're looking at it right here. When you decide what to do with your hands, whether to take action or inaction, there are two checkpoints. Head, do I think this is a good idea? Heart, do I feel this is a good idea? If both are on board, you proceed with the action. If one is not on board, you pause, you try to solve for the gap, and I'll come back to what we do in that scenario. If neither is on board, then that's a hard stop. That is the inaction that we need. So here's what I'm gonna share with you. This is the signal. When you check in with your head and heart, there's only three lanes on this highway, green, yellow, red, that's it. The easiest one, my head is on board, my heart is on board, green freaking light, go, go. That's awesome. That's how you live a more purposeful 365 life. Head and heart are like, yes, let's go. Sorry, Amber, I saw your, let's go, there we go. Hers is better, hers is way better. Okay, the hard part, the messy middle as others have called it is the yellow. My head or my heart is not on board. So two quick examples, head and heart. So my head says do it, my heart is like ah. Anybody here ever had a New Year's resolution that didn't see the light of Feb 1? Nah, ah, yeah. Maybe, it, maybe for me, it's usually something health related. Oh, Paul, you, you enjoy the holidays a little too much. Sweaters are a little snug. I gotta lose 10 pounds. Head's like, lose 10 pounds, bro. Lose 10 pounds. But here's the thing, I give up. Because my heart never made that decision. It was just a head reason. Quick story about a thought leader that I love his stuff, Ed Milet. Ed is a chiseled guy, a former athlete, the whole thing. So on the outside looks perfect, but on the inside, he wasn't so perfect. So goes to the doc and the doc says, Ed, what have you been doing to yourself? Like my goodness. And so this was a typical health visit that had some testing and was gonna lead to some procedures and he, unless he changed. And he said, Ed, remind me, you have one child, don't you have a second on the way? Yeah, yeah, actually we're a couple months away. Boy or girl, girl, and the doctor, Rather than saying what was safe, he said, 
do you want to be the one that walks her down the aisle? Hmm. Ed said, every single day in my life since then, I have had optimal health. And like he's obsessed with health, not because he needed to lose 10 pounds. Because he wants to walk his daughter down the aisle. He ignited his heart. He needed, in this case, somebody called him out on it. Unless they're both on board, how could we possibly consistently follow through? And then a red light, neither is on board, and we're taking action regardless. And you're like, dude, stop stressing me out, man, with every single decision. And it's just like, but here's the reality. All right, so you're heading your heart or not on board. And you move forward. Is it going to derail your life one time? Probably not. But six months, 12 months, 24 months down the road, we keep running reds. And let me ask you if this sounds familiar with maybe what we or the people around us are struggling with. Burnout. Stuck. Fatigued. Not happy. Not fulfilled. Bad relationship with person, boss, or company. This is what happens when we run red lights over time. We don't check in with our head and our heart. And that's why this equation can be so powerful. It is so simple. It is so simple. It's not easy. It's simple. And we just need to be true to the fact of why do we end up in tough spots? When we go back and try to get that win on Monday morning and we face obstacles, we got to ask ourselves, is this a green, yellow, red? And here's the goal. Excuse me, the goals that we need to seek if we get them up here. The mission is to attack the green. Feel the magic of the green. And then you keep seeking it out, seeking it out. And it becomes an obsession. This is the through line when I talk to people that have achieved success and significance. They are living a whole lot. Not purely, that's not life. But they just find new ways to create green lights. Yellow, not the easy button. But now you know how to navigate it. And here's the thing about yellow, folks. Sucks saying this, but if you stay in yellow too long, it's just as good as a red. A quick example. I was a sales leader, managed a big team. Okay, top producer, but they're toxic to the company. My heart's like, get him or her out of here. They're toxic. But we got goals. We got widgets. We got quarterly earnings. We got monthly expectations. I'm up for that promotion. All these things running through my head, and I knew what my heart said. I needed to overcome those limiting beliefs, solve for the gap in order. Otherwise, that person stays, the yellow stays, and eventually it has a red effect every single day. And then the red, we just need to be conscious of them and stop running them. So in the closing minute or two here, here's the piece. This head, heart, hand equation, green, yellow, red. It's limited if we keep the impact in this room. And everyone said this. This is a tool for how to express that first win on Monday morning. We need to go inspire others to do the same. My hope is that it's so simple, you can explain the head, heart, hands equation in the green, yellow, red very simply within minutes because this, there's no pride in authorship here. To me, this is about amplification. This is about impact. This is about going out and saying, check in with your head and your heart. Is it a green, yellow, red? And now you know what to do. That's it. It can be that simple. And so as we close out here, I want you to think of that one thing you commit to, departing the Purpose Summit. The one win on Monday that you are most inspired about. Think of that green light right now. One thing where your head thinks it's a good idea and your heart feels it's a good idea. Raise your hand if you have that green light in your head and heart right now. You know that green light that's waiting on Monday. Awesome. A little over half of the room raised their hands. Bless you for the other half. We got a couple days, but this should be as simple as what's one thing or one person that I'm inspired to do? Does my head say I'm on board? Does my heart say I'm on board? And if so, green light. Join me in a world of purpose. Join me in a world of green lights because I promise you if the end game is a life and a business of greater purpose, I believe that the head, heart, hands equation is the only equation that you'll ever need. Thank you.